Good evening, everyone. I'm Shama Rahman, Marketing Manager for the New York Times Live Conversation and Performance Series Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of music, film, theater, art, fashion, literature, and science. I'm very excited to welcome you to tonight's special event with iconic indie pop singer and songwriter Like Lee, who joins us for an evening of spirited conversation and music from her critically acclaimed new album, So Sad, So Sexy. Like will discuss putting her own spin on contemporary pop and R&B and how her creative process has evolved with each life experience with our moderator, Milena Rizek, culture reporter for the New York Times. Following the conversation, the Swedish musician will mesmerize us with the sounds of her honey-soaked voice as she performs songs from her latest album. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Like Lee and Milena Rizek. to be here with all of you and with Lika here. Um, I'm going to start by saying that we did break into the Mezcal backstage so things could get really interesting out here. Um, yeah, if, you know, if, if anybody has any ideas for drinking games, maybe shout them out later. Um, we are going to have a couple minutes for audience Q&A at the end, and I'll let you know when, that, when we're ready for that. We'll have mics and stuff so everybody can hear you. And then we are all in for a treat to hear some music live in this very intimate space. So thanks again. Let's get started. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you. And I want to start by talking a little bit about your beginnings, your background. You grew up with artist parents. Your father is also a musician. Your mother is a photographer. And you had a kind of a bohemian childhood, right? Did you, did you, what was your relationship like to creativity growing up? Um, well, my whole childhood was very loose. I lived in, I was born in the south of Sweden, then moved to Stockholm and then to Portugal on a hilltop without um, any electricity, like barely in nothing. So it was all about like playing and then uh, a lot of rave parties and <laughs> drugs at a very young age. So yeah, it was a free time. <laughs> that's that's exactly how I would have imagined that to go. Yeah. Um, did you were you interested in being an artist as a kid? Did you think about yourself that way? Uh, no, it was more. I was always I was very shy actually as a kid, and I was the middle child and very tortured. Um, and my mom was very loud and eccentric. So it was really all about her. And then I and my sister was like beating me up. So I was like the middle child, and then always, the only time I felt okay was when I was singing or dancing. And then I discovered Michael Jackson when I lived in Portugal. The first time we had a TV, I saw black and white, the video. And then I was like, yes, this is what I want to be. Like, this is what I want to do. I want to be in a desert and dance and be free. <laughs> Wear like a golden suit. Thing. So even though you had, you know, music and art in your life, it was Michael Jackson that was the oh, catalyst. Yeah. Yes. Also, I love that he loved children. <laughs> As a child. <laughs> it's true. I was like, maybe he can come and get me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is not getting filmed, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to let that one go. Um, <laughs> so at what point was it after the Michael Jackson black and white moment that you start to think, you know, not only did you want to do this, did you think, well, maybe I can do this? Were you writing songs? Were you jotting not at poetry that down? So then I, was, I discovered ballet when I was about five in Portugal, and then we had to move back to Sweden when um, I was eight, and it was pretty traumatic because we had to take a car without any insulation and like drive through Europe and get to Stockholm. No, not even Stockholm, like a shithole 
outside of Stockholm with like no money, no life. So then the whole time I was just, I had my Walkman, or was it that it was called? Walk yeah, Walkman, <laughs> the yellow one? The black one. Oh. Uh, and I listened to Blonde Ambition, like borderline. Like, so when I got to Sweden, I was really lost as a person. So then I thought, I'm just gonna dance. So then I danced for like 10 years. And that's what I was gonna do, be a dancer. And then when I was 15, I realized, like, this blows. You just have to like be in a split <laughs> and like practice and be there and get like audition and be like, no, you can't do a split, bye. <laughs> so then I was like, maybe I should be an artist. And then uh, I was already in dance school, like dance high school, so then I wanted to be a musician and I applied for the music school, did not get in. <laughs> like did not get in. <laughs> They're like, excuse me. <laughs> it was a lot of that actually growing up, like me trying out for a musical and like, tomorrow, thank you. <laughs> so definitely not like a big talent. Uh, <laughs> then I did get into this free form school where there's a lot of like all the dropout kids basically and me and I was really ambitious and people really hate ambition in Sweden. So I was pretty much <laughs> bullied for like three years. And then I really, this was my dog years, like total depression, anorexic, bullied. And then I started taking, I went to a gospel choir with all the immigrant kids in Sweden. Uh, and I think that's where I discovered like really the healing energy of singing and then I took because I was broke and my parents didn't have any money so I did also like free piano classes with me and like three eight-year-olds <laughs> at 15 <laughs> <laughs> and I learned the doors uh, and then I thought I read a lot I read like all the books like how you always have to go to New York so then when I was 19 I came here and I went to the Apple store and like, Bob Dylan, open mic. And then I started doing that a lot. Got booed out, because I'm not a big beauty or a great voice, so it was tough. I think you're selling yourself a little short. Well, now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> this took hours, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to the idea of the gospel choir and that sense of uplift that you found in, in a yeah. dark time. Tell me more about that because, um, you know, it's a super interesting way to approach music, especially when you're coming from a musical background and having a musical education to some degree to find a different avenue of music there. Yeah, that was the best. And also because I've moved around a lot, I've never really felt Swedish. I've always felt more like at home with people that are not from Sweden either. So it's like a very interesting community where everyone came from a pretty rough place and we all like sang harmonies like Kirk Franklin in Stockholm. It's really strange. Do you guys know Kirk Franklin, the gospel star? Maybe not yet. Okay. Yeah, right? Like in Stockholm, I was like silver, <laughs> gold, like all those. Like with the robes and everything? No, it was not like that. It was only for singing, yeah. And did you have a, a sense of musical direction at that point? Did you think this is the kind of, I mean, you went Michael Jackson, Madonna, Kirk Franklin. What was the kind of music that you envisioned yourself making? Well, I think uh, the first CD I ever bought was Lauryn Hill. And then I had it, like, I lost my virginity to D'Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was a lot of that kind of music. And then more, then I started going back to like, oh, Bob Dylan or Neil Young, all of that. Uh, but then I think actually getting booed out in New York was really the game changer for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I realized then that like I don't have this big, this was the time where it was like Beyonce or Mariah Carey, like a lot of like, 
you know? And then I tried that and like got booed out. So then I really realized that like, wow, it doesn't, and also discovering Nina Simone was a big thing for me. Cause like her, you just feel like it's her heart out. There's no filters, there's not a, it's nothing about the voice. It's just about the feeling and the mm -hmm. message. So then I thought if I'm gonna have a shot at this, I really have to just write my own songs. So then I started writing. After the getting booed? Well, yeah, around then, yeah. And you've said that you, you, know, you kind of came late to singing. You've said that the voice in your head, the, the, the voice you have is not the voice in your head. What do you imagine? What did you imagine that you might sound like? Um, Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, yeah. It's been hard. <laughs> to not sound like Johnny Cash? <laughs> yeah. Well, in the beginning, too, because I also, like, I've never been a big fan of my voice, so when people would be like, oh, she has this cute, girly voice, I'd be like, are you not trying to understand what I'm doing? I'm, like, talking about my heart aches. So, was, like, I felt trapped in my girly voice, if you know what I mean. And do you still have that feeling? Um, well, now I think life has given me enough shit, so now I smoke as much as I can, like drink. So. <laughs> it's getting raspier. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and when you moved to New York when you were 19, you moved to Bushwick, Brooklyn, and at, at that time, not a lot of you know, Swedish artists were moving solo to Bushwick. Now, Bushwick is like mostly Swedish artists. <laughs> um, but tell me what, and then you came back and recorded an album here, but tell me what New York brought to you, you know, as an artist, as a performer. Mm, everything. Um, I mean, I didn't also, in Bushwick, people think like, oh, this loft. No, I lived in a rail, like, what's it called? Like a railroad, railroad apartment? Yeah. Like, a room with no windows, no heat. So it was rough. I like ride the train and like bring a little jar of like tofu and be out in the city all day. And then I would show up at a bar in like East Village and I had uh, borrowed my sister's ID because I guess you have to be 21 to drink here. So then I would order a gin and tonic and like put my name on and like, I know how to play piano, but they didn't have piano, so I would just write down like four chords and be like, please, can you play guitar for me? And then I would be there for hours, like watch like really bad performers. And then I would get on. And it was interesting because even, like some people would think I was shit, but then there would be somebody who's like, wow, you really got it, girl. <laughs> and that I had never heard before in my life. So. Like, people are a bit more open and encouraging here. Like, this is what New York is about. So that kind of somehow gave me a little kick in the butt. You got some confidence. Confidence, but also broken confidence. But I guess it's the same thing. I mean, you know, if you can make it here, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, did, I had to go back after three months and work at a nursery home for a year and a half in Sweden, like wiping ass. <laughs> <laughs> and worse things. I don't think there are any sayings about that part of your life. <laughs> um, so one of the things I like about you, and you talked about it for a second here, is that that vulnerability that you have in your songwriting, I think a lot of artists, you know, they write, they write the music and then they kind of mash in the words, they retrofit the language, even the sounds, without necessarily thinking about what that means. And that's, that's not a knock, that's just one way to write music. And I get the sense that you are not writing music that way. Tell me a little bit about your process. Um, well, I think for me it also comes back to when I was a teenager and really felt really alone in the world. Like, what's wrong with me? So the only thing that would give me some type of solace is if I would listen to a song and I would feel like, oh, they feel the same as I do. And so when I started writing, it's more that I haven't felt that good in my time on this earth. So it's more about me like trying to get this shit 
out. So I'm just trying to describe like exactly what I'm feeling. And the only satisfaction is if I can get as close to the truth of what I'm feeling. It, so it's more like, yeah, what do I call that? I just write exactly what I'm feeling. And then that gives me some type of relief. Yeah. Like, it sounds like music in a way is a form of therapy? Yeah. I don't, I hate that term, but yes. A form of catharsis? What does it feel like then to play those songs over and over, to relive those moments? Well, now that I'm in like my fourth album of like heart, I'm kind of like, girl, like get it together. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, ooh. <laughs> Like, really? Um, Is this a moment to have some mezcal? <laughs> <laughs> Especially on, I don't know if anyone heard I Never Learn, because I was really, like, caught. Like, I, and I remember I had also, like, I wrote the album, and then while I was touring it, I had split up with, like, what was the love of my life back then. So it was really crazy. I felt like I was in some in my Bayman movie, like crying backstage and then like doing it on stage and like crying. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> but also totally <laughs> fucked up, yeah. <laughs> I am getting to work through it, yeah. but there's just another album coming. I'll, you know what I mean? There'll be another album after this one too. <laughs> I think sometimes performers who use their music and their songwriting to talk about their own emotions, you know, one thing that helps them is that sense of connection with the audience yeah. when you're performing and you have that sense that, you know, many people have gone through heartbreak and things like that that you've talked about. And do you feel, you know, is that one of the reasons that you keep doing this, keep going back out there because you have that sense of connection? No, I'm honestly <laughs> like really self-involved. It's all about like, me <laughs> and my own shit because it's just never ending but uh i do appreciate you all coming <laughs> uh no it's beautiful but mostly i do write for myself because like i don't know how to live this life otherwise yeah are there are there songs that are not about you kind of people always assume that <laughs> uh, so the, the, your three albums that you wrote in your, in your 20s, you've talked about how that's a sort of trilogy. When you look back at that now from the vantage point of your 30s, what, was, what do you see in that, in that set of music or what do you hear in it? Like, damn. Sorry, again? What do you see in those three albums when you thought of them, you sort of conceived of them as a, as a trilogy, those albums? Yeah, well, wrote? I do think that was a very, it's kind of like my Anna Frank diary. Sorry, that's so, <laughs> but like, not a good time and very, like, introspective. Uh, and I think this latest album was more like time to, like, open up and get, a wider look and like try to have a little more fun. Do you keep a diary? No, this is my diary. Like I make case studies on each relationship. <laughs> and how do you, do you talk about that with people that you're in relationships with? I mean, at this point they're probably aware. <laughs> some are proud, some are not, <laughs> that they have work about them. It's, it, it's getting more complicated. Um, do you, so, so Sad, So Sexy is the first album you've written in your 30s, and it also came at a time with a lot of changes in your life. Um, was that something that was a new challenge for you to try and capture that? Yeah, this was definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. Also because of what I was going through. I don't know if any, I know you can't see it, but I did have a baby. <laughs> and that was really hard. Yeah. Dion. Dion. Oh, yeah. 
Well, we were talking backstage a little bit because our kids are almost the same age about the difficulties of being an artist and being a mother at the same time. I think a lot of people have faced those hurdles and not everybody has figured out how to deal with it Yeah. because there's the challenges of travel and logistics and scheduling and there's a sense of identity shift that comes with that. Is that something you're figuring out now? Yeah, it was really way harder than... Um, I thought it would be and also I've spent a lot of time I think just as a woman you don't have especially if you're an artist there's not a lot of people who have babies like there's a lot of the biggest icons that kind of didn't or chose to not have children so there's definitely something that I always kept in mind like oh if I'm on this artist path then maybe I will never be a mother so there's also something I really wanted I wanted to be a mother more because I was an artist almost because I thought like maybe I'll never have that so when that happened um, I I thought also that maybe I would get cured of my hunger and ambition but it totally like blew it up (laughs) Um, and it was hard in the beginning like being at home and not because I did spend like almost all my life just doing this so to be at home and and also just to I was scared that I was going to lose the muscle as a writer so I kind of forced myself to start writing pretty early um, like after maybe three months but it was a bunch of crap and this is also like I don't know if anyone knows this either but my mom got diagnosed with brain cancer right when he was born so it was like my mom was dying basically and I had a newborn and I was also out of my label deal I was like totally burnt out like I never want to tour again I don't want anyone to see me I just want to be a writer so I didn't have a deal I didn't have a manager like I was not in the best situation and also the way people look at you after you have a baby like oh you had a baby like ciao (laughs) (laughs) so I started And also I had moved to LA, so everything was different. I didn't work with my old producer, so I was really, really insecure and really scared, but also really hungry. So it was an interesting time to just like throw myself out there and and start over. But also tricky with the whole time thing. You realize probably as a man, you get more time to like be a genius and if you're a woman and a mom, you're always thinking about your child. So it's, it's really a hard thing. Yeah, I don't think anybody has ever asked the Rolling Stones about yeah. their relationship to fatherhood like, while they've been on the road. Yeah. Maybe relatively recently, but certainly... Or even in certainly, the studio, everything. Yeah, yeah, certainly not in their heyday. And it is something that female artists have to think about. Yeah. And so how much of that did you put into the record, all of those big emotions? <sighs> well, it also became such a refuge to, to go to the studio and write. But it was definitely like I couldn't be there until four in the morning and be like, hi, you know? So I like went home at 6 p.m., <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Exhausted. Um, but it was interesting. I got to like create another world and like make myself stronger than I was feeling or make myself sexier than I was feeling. So it was wonderful. And also, in a way, I think before I never thought that anything I did was good and I would like lay awake for nights thinking about like a high hat and I still did that like drove myself crazy but I also like I didn't you know I have a kid like I can only do what I can do like this is the best I could do with the circumstances and it's just important for me to work and not think so much about the outcome like it is what it is this was my life now. Well, every album is a, is a, captures a moment yeah. in time, and that's what it sounds like this was for you. Yeah. Um, and you had the opportunity to work with a bunch of different producers in LA. What was the sound that you wanted for this album? Well, I think this was the first time in my life where um, I've been really also living in America for a while now. Like, I kind of understand what it's all about more. Do you want to share? Because some of us are still confused. <laughs> um, it's a really interesting place. It's a very eclectic 
place where like it's really all about like make that money baby and like <laughs> just make it in general you know what I mean like get out of here like you can do whatever you want and that's not the vibe in Sweden hmm ambition. ambition like reinvention like put on that lipstick and like work bitch <laughs> you know um does that make sense <laughs> Yeah. And so the sound that you wanted for well, the album yeah, was... Yeah, well, I was also, like, for the first time, really inspired. I've always loved hip-hop, like, always, but I've never let it shine through before. And this time I was just like, like, Kendrick Lamar is my god. You know what I mean? And my biggest sadness is that I'm like, will never come close to him. <laughs> or be as relevant or as good as him. So just having, like... I'm in LA and there's like people like that that are so fucking good and like relevant and modern. And even LA as a place, it's so weird and crazy. So I was like listening to the radio, like hip hop radio, driving around like alone in the canyon. That is the only way to be in LA, by the yeah. way. You gotta get an amazing car and dr or a Prius and then drive around yeah. <laughs> blasting hip hop. Yeah. That's how I do it anyway. So I was really just like, I want to just like, I want to be the underdog and I want to learn and I want to be just like the, the worst, you know what I mean? In a, like I'm in a room where, with people that are so great and like, who am I? That's where I wanted to be. So I was just trying things with different people. And how do you feel it worked out? Mm, how, how did it? How do you feel it worked out? Uh, how do you feel? What do you think? <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think. I think again. I think you're selling yourself short on the not being as good as Kendrick. But we'll leave that to other audiences to decide. Um, do you? Are you one of those people that feel like if you had a moment where you are truly content in your life, that maybe your artistic ability would, or your creative output would suffer? I just cannot remember a time where I was content, so I don't know what that feeling is. Maybe like after a pizza? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So no going to the studio right after you have pizza, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, talking about people to work with in LA, you worked with David Lynch. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what that experience was like. Uh, uh, transcendent. Um, it was so interesting and so trippy. And I mean, he did teach me how to meditate, so I don't know if there's anyone here that does that, but you do get into that kind of zone where it's just like a zone. So when we did the song, like we were in the zone. And he, he, would, he would just stand and scream like, Leaky, you're on a train and the train is going faster, 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 faster. And like the whole thing is just improvised. I'm just like, Ooh, okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's like, yes, yes, it feels good. It feels good, Leaky, it feels good, Leaky Lee. So I don't know, we were just in the zone. Yeah. Is that an experience that you could ever recreate? I mean... Maybe if I took acid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I'm not opposed to. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more about the album and some of the you know, emotions that you are talking about. There's a lot of... Well, you tell me, how much of, the, of your albums are about romantic love versus other kinds of love? Probably 99%. <laughs> Um, and is there anything that you feel like, you know what, I'm not going to put this in music? Uh, no, I think music is the place where you need to tear your soul apart and out. But I do regret some interviews I've done. <laughs> <laughs> not this one. <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> Like when I've talked about things outside of music. What, is there anything else that you have that relationship to, to dance, anything else, or is it just this one outlet for you? Uh, no, I, I mean, dancing is also like 
my thing. I love to dance. That was my safe place for so many years. So yes, it's a combination. How do you feel about your own dance moves? We know how you feel about your own singing. Uh, the thing about my dance moves is I'm like a really good dancer, but nobody <laughs> knows it, and no one will ever see it. Why not? <laughs> I just like to keep that one. I, I will see. I might bust it out <laughs> one day. <laughs> Which one? No, but someone in the audience like, is asking about I'm good, I'm gone I, for out, people out on the internet that. if you want to hear what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, but that was just like improvisation. But I mean like I can do like a one, two, three, like, you know? <laughs> Could you pirouette in your, ballet, in your ballet days? If I did what? Could you pirouette in your ballet days? Yes. I, on toes, everything, yeah. Yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding out hope that we're going to be able to see that sometime. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions now. So there's going to be a couple of mics uh, on either side of the aisle here. If you guys have questions, come and line up behind the mics, and that way everybody will be able to hear you. I won't be able to call on you in the audience, so try and sneak out to the mics if you can. Um, so you're about to go out on tour. And um, what is your experience with touring like now? Do you feel excited about it? Is there more anxiety? Um, because you do have to uproot your family a little bit. Mm, I do feel excited about it. Honestly, like if you have a two and a half year old, like being on tour is like vacation. <laughs> so I'm excited. And tour is actually quite rigorous. No, it's, I'm like laughing. before I was dead before. So now I'm like, I don't know what that says about my... <laughs> Well-being, yeah. <laughs> right, having a toddler is no <laughs> match for being. That's on a tour. hard. It's harder than being on tour. <laughs> yeah. Take that, Keith Richards. Okay. Um, uh, how about over here? Um, so your music has always made so much sense to me, no matter what time in my life, and I absolutely love it. But your videos are like visual dialogue to the music, and they're always so incredible and so beautiful. From sadness is a blessing to I follow rivers, and even your more recent stuff, how much of that creative process are you in? Or are you just kind of like, I made the music, director, figure out, you know, the feeling for the video, or are you a part of that as well? I am 100% a part of it. Yeah. So usually I date the director. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I thought about this thing. I want Stellan Skarsgård to be my father and you're gonna direct it for free. <laughs> um, no, no, I have like, the way I make music too is like when I'm in the studio and building it, when I know that it's getting close to done is like when I see the video. So I have the idea and the concept for everything and then I, you know, find the director. If I'm not together with them, then I employ, you know, it's a, more of a dialogue. Um, no, I, I come up with the, the mood boards but I choose the director too, so right. we do it together. So it's a very collaborative experience. Very cool, thank you. Thank you. Uh, over here. Hey, well, first of all, I wanted to say I saw you at All Points East. You reposted my Get Witchy <laughs> photo, which I was happy you liked, because I was like, well, she liked it that I said we're getting witchy, but you did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know, uh, one of the covers that I love that you've done is Silver Spring. I was wondering what other songs you would do if you had to do a cover album. Uh, there's a lot of songs I would do. One song that I'm completely obsessed with right now is, uh, what is that Whitney Houston song? Don't make me come I have nothing. People will be like, no, oh, don't I do have that. No oh, I have nothing. <laughs> that, that one. But I'll, I feel sing like I'll sing it with you. People would... <laughs> not appreciate me tearing her song apart. I would apart. want to hear it. <laughs> I would do that one. There's a lot. I, I, I love good songs. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to do that when I'm like old and nobody wants to. I'll still be listening. <laughs> Thank you. <Good>. Thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hello, I'm tall. Okay, um, I have to adjust that. Um, what does your creative process look like 
um, like for creating a song or um, like choosing songs for an album, but mostly like writing a song, like what does that process look like for you? Mm. Unfortunately, I only do write songs when I'm like in a tumultuous space. So then it's more like I've been through something emotionally and then I come up with a line maybe or a title or I just go to the studio and work with someone like Elsie, where is she? Somewhere. She's coming on stage. The wonderful woman that I wrote most of the album with. Like, you just show up and then you start playing some chords and then something just comes. And then you just follow the little thread until it's done. But I usually have some lyrics with me or a concept or a feeling, a situation. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So um, you posted on your Instagram once this one quote that I think kind of perfectly sums up your artistic credo, which is the only way out is in. And I wanted to ask you about kind of how your relationship with your physical and your writing voice um, relates to that quote and whether, you know, you spoke very candidly about not liking your physical voice. And I was wondering if your writing voice had a part in kind of healing that sense of not being physically capable of expressing what you're feeling inside. Yes, very much so. Because I think, um, I mean, even in therapy, if you're able to like describe a feeling, then it sets you free. So it did do that for me that um, like what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to tap into is, is more important than my actual voice, like the essence of the emotion. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so, So Sad, So Sexy is my album of 2018. Um, when you released Deep End and um, Hard Rain, my life changed. Um, <laughs> they're so good. I've been waiting for this album for so long. Oh, thank um, you. And my favorite is Bad Woman, and I was wondering if there's a song that maybe really resonates with you or if you have one standout track on the album. Yeah, I think Bad Woman was actually one of the first songs that I wrote that made it into the album, and when I did that line... That totally just came to me like, I'm a bad woman, but I'm still you. I was like, ooh, that's me. It's so, it's <laughs> like, so good. Um, <laughs> so that made it in. <laughs> and then Hard Rain was also very important because that one I felt, because I improvised that one, uh -huh. and I was able to just tap into something very subconscious, and the whole song just came, and it was really describing like, my relationship from every type of angle. And then when I wrote So Sad, So Sexy, no, I actually wrote Better Alone. And then I was listening back to what we had written and I was like, oh, that's so sad, but so sexy. And I was like, oh. Ah. <laughs> Light bulb. <laughs> Album title. <laughs> and then I wrote So Sad, So Sexy. And that really still hits the spot for it's me. It's like the best phrase anyone's ever come <laughs> up with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do album titles usually come that, like, have that eureka moment for you? Yes. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> um, I've always felt like your music because I've been listening to you since like I was in seventh grade and I've dealt with some like similar Ooh, issues here. Really old. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been always able to like kind of make it a, like somehow internalize it, project myself into it, make it about myself. But just this past So Sad, So Sexy when it came out, it, I was ready to do that again. It came out like the month after my boyfriend had passed away. So I invited oh, my sad. friend to come over and we were listening to it and we both kind of felt it spoke to like bigger issues and we didn't like, I was wondering if when you wrote that album and then when you decided to like do the Instagram story music video, if you were kind of making a bigger commentary about everything that's like going on in like social media. 
Yes, for sure. Um, I was. Uh, especially, I think, just even the title of, you know, I've always had a very complicated relationship to, like, being a woman and what it means to, like, be sexy. It feels like that has always belonged to, like, another type of woman or the way that we view women in America. Like, what sexy means is, like, something very, like, uh, like fake, you know what I mean? Like tits and fake this and like pleasure for men and I think just having a European like what maybe we find sex like I feel so sad so sexy is like my European version of what it means to be sexy that it's like you're broken but you're standing in the rain in a trench coat and like je t'aime <laughs> um, but I don't know if that answered the question but then when I was making Deep end, for example, even the sound that I was tapping into, like playing it, when I played that song for like a lot of my friends that I respect, everyone's like, are you like for real putting a trap drum on this song? Like, are you crazy? I think it felt very like intimate, honestly. Yeah. Like, watching like the whole thing as if it was like someone doing an Instagram story felt very personal and I didn't know if that was like speaking on how an issue for like you, how you want to be more personal or, but you still feel like disconnected? Well, I think the vid, like tapping into that song because I was kind of playing with a trap drum, which is like very a thing of the now. Then I was also thinking about like, I want, because in a way this song, the sound of the song might be disposable. Like it might not make it to like a classic song. So then I was also thinking, I want the video to be very much of the now, like disposable, and the way that we live our lives, like through like Instagram is a part of like everyone's life. So I wanted to make something that was very personal, but very the most current and also the most disposable, because that's how like we live our lives today. It's just like a rush. So I wanted the whole video to be like, a rush, and then you can just throw it away. Or you can listen to it on repeat, like yeah. probably most of us have done. All right, I'm gonna say, if, if you're not in line for a question now, that's it, we're gonna cut it off after the folks that are out here just so we have time to listen to some music, so go ahead. First, thanks for doing this. Oh, thank um, you. Saw you first 10 years ago, 20th time a month ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> at Alea, which was amazing. We headlined next to Kendrick. Oh. That was an amazing first time hearing the album live. Thank you. Going back a couple of years, Live, you know, it was a project where the songs were really different, interesting. Yeah. A, are we ever gonna get to see that here with the full album? And how was it working in that kind of environment with some other artists where it wasn't just you? Yeah, it was uh, wonderful. It was a bunch of my friends who I, you know, we've known each other for years and years and we have a collective together. So I think, all of us were in bands and we were on labels where everything ultimately just becomes like numbers, like you didn't make it or like you blew it. Um, you know, singles, budgets, this and that. And you forget that you actually like love music and you do it because you love music. So our whole point with that band was also to just make something because we love to make it. There's no deadlines, there's no this, there's no that. We're just like write songs and the back to like harmonies, like the healing power of like singing in harmonies. So live is more like a project with no end and no beginning. It's just something that exists. But one day we may see you guys. I mean, after then, this potentially. But then <laughs> you're all busy. I know. You're yeah, there's doing... so many things. Like someone's on tour. Someone had a baby. Someone's getting a divorce. Someone's cat is sick. Like we could never. Make I know you're it. supposed to play Oya, but you did that. Didn't work out. Exactly. Well, thank, thank you for you. this new thank album. You. Thank you. Thank Hi. you for gracing us with your presence. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, so first, if I could distill this interview into one theme, it would be about your ambition. And I'm curious what kind of aspirations you have to further your artistry and to further or grow in your role as a creator. And secondly, another theme that I caught onto was maybe one of suffering. And if you could go back in time, knowing what you know, I'm curious what you would tell your tortured self of your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
just do it. <laughs> Say bye. <laughs> no. um, mm, which one should I answer? The tortured child one? Um, well, I think, I mean, to live is to suffer. So if you can just embrace that suffering is also a beautiful thing. I feel like I, I appreciate art very much. Like I appreciate a good song, a good film. It's, and also you will find people who are like you, who also enjoy those things. So I think it also pushes you deeper and forward. So, uh, you know, or kill yourself too. You know, it's always an option. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, to live is to suffer. Like, get into it. <laughs> right? I think one of the things, like I said earlier, that, that's, that's so striking about you is your ability to be vulnerable in a, in a public setting. And that's one of the things that is crucial for an artist, but it's also very difficult to do. And I think for a lot of people to show your vulnerability is a form of strength, is a form I think so. of power, of, of feeling a, a kind of power in that. Yeah. And I think maybe what people in the audience, what some of your fans might connect to is, is some feeling like that. That's my answer to that question. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, so hi. full disclosure, um, I have not yet listened to your music yet. I'm a plus one, but based off of the enthusiasm <laughs> everyone has, I'm very looking forward to it. Um, I do really appreciate your honesty though, and I'm curious as an artist, um, and as a woman going through so many changes and um, as we all go through changes of identity um, and body, um, how did you prevent um, paralyzing yourself during, I guess, lack of a better word, during your identity crisis, I guess, in general? Um, did you feel like you, you were paralyzed from creating? And if so, how did you stop that? Mm. I did, but then I like chopped my hair off and dyed it blonde. So it's like, I think what's interesting when you're making things is you can create a character, a different world where you can like escape into. So that's kind of what I do. I go into like, okay, I'm Eminem or I'm Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. And you. honestly, I drank a lot of mezcal. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Should I say sorry because I'm crazy? <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> Never apologize for who Hi. you are. Okay. Um, very simple question. Can I get a photo with you? Sure, but <laughs> well, should we do all that after? Yes, we will do that work? after. Oh, I just thought I yeah. <laughs> you can wait. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, you're up next. Do Do you think you'll be able to uh, continue to make music without pain or hurt in your life? Mm, I mean, life gives. Like, I, I'm sure there'll be more things that are painful coming my way, mm. right? <laughs> So I don't know, you know, there's like, we're getting old, like there's gonna be like the world, the climate change, like <laughs> Trump, you know what I mean? Let's, let's hang on to the negative so we can. <laughs> I'm gonna take that as the theme for the night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank I've you. found, uh, an amazing amount of comfort in your music, especially when I'm at my darkest and my lowest. Um, and I think one of the things that makes it so great is how raw it is. Uh, and I was wondering if you ever had fear about how vulnerable your music is and just putting yourself out there in that way and how you overcame that fear. think when I'm making things I never think that anyone is gonna listen to it or see it so somehow like I create a safety space but yeah like it is a scary thing but I never I'm never scared of like being too honest or being for me it's more like 
what if I'm not real enough? Because that's what I, when I listen, like I don't want to listen to anything or see anything or read anything that's not real. Mm -hmm. So it's more like that. Like what if I'm too boring or like too timid? Yeah. Like you just got to, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, we've been talking a lot about Sosato Sexy. The newest album is great, but my question is about I Never Learn. Specifically about the song, which is also my favorite, I Will Never Love Again, which is my favorite track, but I, I always kept on thinking, that's a really bold statement, like I will never, like, and to put it out there in a song. So my question is, do you still feel like that after all this time? I like never want to love again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, love is a fucker. Um, uh, I did write a song recently that had like the lyrics, single forever, whatever, fuck the world, <laughs> I'll be fine. I don't know, I can't answer that. Yeah, I f feel like that. <laughs> well, there's a lot of different kinds of love. Exactly. That you experience, not just romantic love. Yes. Which has its place. Finally an adult here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's the love for, of a parent for their child. Exactly. The love of an audience full of fans for an artist. Yeah. Are you guys ready to hear some music? Yeah. 